All right, so we're going to be uh, in the book of Zechariah for most of tonight, but um, just back in Acts chapter 10, there's three things I want to take out of this. Um, first, we see in verse 30, and uh, Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. So keep in mind of that. As well as verse 43 and 44, which is the theme of this uh, sermon, uh, which is, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. So they heard that and they believed and they received the Holy Ghost. Amen. You know, so and Zechariah, I'll get you to turn there to Zechariah chapter 3. And that's where we'll be for most of the night. Um, you know, he's got prophecies of all three comings of Christ. You've got the first coming, which of course is when he came to die on the cross and save mankind from their sins, the second coming to rapture the saints out of God's wrath, and the third coming, which is to establish his kingdom in the millennium. Um, and, you know, you'll see all three present in the book of Zechariah, but that's not the only comings there's been as well. So, I mean, he appeared before Abraham, he's appeared before many men, you know, in the form of a man, all throughout the Old Testament. But today we're going to be uh, concentrating on that first coming in the book of Zechariah, because you know, this is a salvation that we trust in, and these men as well, Cornelius, when they heard of that same testimony, they believed it and they were saved. Um, so I just love how it says, to, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So all the prophets give witness to this. It's not just Zechariah, um, but that's the one we'll be concentrating on tonight. So the title of this sermon is The Gospel According to Zechariah. So in Zechariah chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. I mean, what a sight this must be as well. I mean, just to think about what he's actually seeing here. Um, and the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? So I want you to turn to Jude, and we'll start reading from verse 17. But this, this will remind you of something that we've all read in Jude. It says, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. But beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted, spotted by the flesh. Yeah, so we were all plucked out of the fire. When we received Jesus Christ, we believed the gospel. We, every one of us, anyone who's a believer, has been plucked out of the fire. And, you know, I just love how this language here that is, is speaking that is not this a brand plucked out of the fire. It's talking about someone, you know, isn't this somebody who's mine? Isn't this someone who believes? You know, in the same set of any believer, you know, so there's a lot of things we'll get from Zechariah that we know to be true, according to the New Testament, that all the Old Testament prophets all speak of, um, because everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ, and they all prophesied of his comings. So we can pick up in verse 3, it says, Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. So we see the old garments are taken away, and the new garments are given, which are pure, white, and clean, and unspotted. So what are these filthy garments, and what are these new garments? So I'll turn to Isaiah chapter 64. So we'll read from Isaiah 64, starting in verse 1. It says, O thou wouldest rend the heavens, thou that wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. And when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy, no, thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things, which were, not, which were looked not to, not for, thou camest down, the mountain flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, 
those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wrath, for we have sinned. In those in his countenance, uh, continuance, sorry. In those his continuance, and we shall be saved. This is a verse, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay and thou our potter. And we all are the work of thy hand. Be not wrath, be not wrath very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. So we see here that the filthy rags, they're our own righteousness and our iniquities. That's what our, we are clothed in. You know, before we come to Christ, we're just clothed in these filthy rags. That's all we have to offer. You know, it's, our, it's trying to work your way to heaven. It's your own righteousness. And it's just, we're all full of sin. But there's only one way to be made clean. You don't have to turn there. I'll read to you from Daniel 12. I'll get you to turn to Revelation chapter 3. In Daniel 12, 8, it says, and I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the, end of, till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do, shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So we see that being made white is the apparel of the saints and of angels, and also of the Lord himself. You know, it's the holiness of God, the imputed righteousness of the Lord. In Matthew 17, 2, it says, And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. In Matthew 28, 1, it says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And you remember also in Acts 10 when it talks about the man who stood before Cornelius after answering his prayer, said his clothing was very bright. You know, so he's wearing also the, the apparel of an angel or of the Lord or of a saint. So starting in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, it says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast the name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief, when thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even inside us which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So again we see here that those who overcometh, that's those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to be clothed in white raiment and they will not blot out their name out of the book of life. Uh, just turn over to Romans, uh, Revelation chapter 6, just a few pages over, and we'll just read verse 9, 10, and 11. It says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that thou shouldest rest for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren, they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So again, these are the saints under the altar of God. You know, the, um, they receive white robes as well. And that's one thing, when we get to heaven, we receive white robes because we are then holy and pure. The man that's born of God, the new man, when he gets to heaven, he's without sin. So we receive that, that clothing as we get to heaven. And we can see that this, this is what happens as well to the people who died during the Great Tribulation. In Revelation 19, 6 as well, it says, And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as a voice of many waters, as a voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife had made herself ready. 
And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So again, that's our righteousness, what's imputed unto us by the Lord Jesus Christ, because our righteousness are as filthy rags. So, you know, it's not our righteousness, but we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And that's what that fine linen is. Um, you know, and it's been washed in the blood of the Lamb. We'll see that shortly. Um, I'll get you to turn to Isaiah chapter 6, but I'll read as well from Revelation 7. It just says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And he said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You know, so we see that illustration with Joshua the high priest, his iniquities being forgiven. You know, and we see that that's a picture with the filthy rags being taken away and he's given white robes of righteousness, which is the imputed righteousness of Christ. And it even says that his iniquities were, were taken away, which, you know, again, when we're saved, our iniquities are taken away from us. So in Isaiah, the next thing we'll see, it's an illustration of Jesus Christ, who's the, high, is the king and the high priest. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. And I mean, I absolutely, most people do, they love this, uh, this per, uh, portion of scripture because um, it's so beautiful and descriptive. But we'll just start in verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. So I'll get you to turn back to Zechariah chapter 3. And we'll see here in verse 5. It says, And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head, so they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. Now a mitre, um, if you're not aware, is, it's usually something like a, a hat that a priest would wear. Um, and we'll see also in, in chapter 6, it speaks about crowns. You know, it's speaking about things you'd wear on your head. So these are things that are being placed on Joshua. It's being, a mitre is being placed on his head, signifying a priesthood. And we'll see the crowns as well, signifying a kingship. Um, so in Zechariah chapter 6, just over the page, starting in verse 11, it says, Then take silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place. He shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. So Jesus Christ, as it says in Hebrews, we're about to read, you know, he's the high priest and he's a king after the order of Melchizedek, you know, and we are also kings and priests after the Lord. So uh, I'll get you to turn to Hebrews chapter 5, and after that we'll be turning to Revelation chapter 1, if you want to prepare that. But in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1, says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity? And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so for himself, to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honour him, unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And as he said in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. 
Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So it's hard to look in Zechariah and just not see his salvation everywhere. You know, and the Lord's coming, he's offering his righteousness, he's removing our filthy rags, and he's replacing them with his, with his own clean robes of righteousness. Now, he's also crowning us with the mitre of the priesthood and with the kingly crown of the kingdom. So in Revelation chapter 1, I had you turn there, we'll start from verse 1. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep these things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and unto the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever, uh, forever and ever, amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So one thing I'll get you to just, just take a note of is, speaks about, you know, there's the seven spirits which are before the throne. This will come up later um, when it speaks about the stone and the seven stones that are placed upon it. Um, but also we see here, you know, that um, every eye shall see him, they also which pierced him, you know, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. We'll see in Zechariah as well, it speaks about how, you know, they'll look on him who they've pierced, and also the families are split apart. You know, the, the families of Israel and Judah were split apart, and there was mourning as well for all of that. But in Revelation 5.10 as well, it said that he had made unto us our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. You know, so an important part of this passage, that it's God who calls the high priest. You know, that is don't decide to be a priest. Um, you know, that was set apart as Levites, and then God himself would choose one out of that to be the high priest of Israel. You know, so he chose Aaron to be the high priest of Israel. He chose Melchizedek, and he chose his son, Jesus Christ, to be our high priest. You know, and he alone was worthy to make that sacrifice, which was acceptable to the Father. That's why he chose his son to die on the cross for us. You know, and he's also chosen us to be the kings and priests after his son. You know, and... I personally believe that Melchizedek is an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I'll, if you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 7, um, we'll just read verses 1 to 4. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like under the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of his spoils. So this passage, you know, describes him as a king and a priest. And he also seems to share names with the Lord as well. You know, Melchizedek was the king of righteousness and the king of peace you know, according to the names that he had. And the Lord our God is the Lord our righteousness. You know, he is the King of righteousness, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, and he was without father, without mother, had no beginning and no end of life, and made like under the Son of God. You know, so that does deserve its own sermon, but I just think it's important to understand who Melchizedek is, especially in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ, because God compares him to Melchizedek and to the priesthood. So back in Zechariah chapter 3, in verse number 6, it says, And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, 
Thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. For behold, the stone which I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. So we see two things here. We see the branch, which is the name that's given, you know, which I believe is Jesus Christ, and the stone as well. We know Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, the foundation stone. He's a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, but to us he's also a precious stone. You know, he is the rock of our salvation. You know, so we see these two things here. Um, but the branch especially, this is what, uh, what's being emphasized in Zechariah. Um, you know, now there are many places where He's called the, the, the branch of Jesse, the root of Jesse, and the root and branch of David, who, of course, is Jesse's son. Um, so, again, these are names that are often associated with our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll get you to turn to uh, Zechariah chapter 9, and we'll read verses 9 to 12. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the colt, the foal of an ass. And I'll cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from river even to the ends of the earth. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. Turn you to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today I declare that I will render double unto thee. So we see Christ here coming to the heathen, coming to the Gentiles. You know, it's speaking about what he's going to do in that day. Uh, and, and we know in, uh, in Zechariah verse 9, in chapter 9 verse 9, you know, this is fulfilled with a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So if you want to turn to John chapter 12, we'll just read that passage quickly, starting in verse 12. It says, John 12, On the next day, much people, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel, that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, thou daughter of Zion, behold, thy King cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, so that's when he returned after he died and raised from the dead, said, Then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things under him. So even then, like the apostles didn't understand everything straight up, but they started to notice that these things had been fulfilled. They remember the old scriptures of Zechariah and, and the sayings of Jeremiah, and they knew that these things had come to pass. So back in Zechariah chapter 11 this time, We'll see another prophecy here. It says, And I took my, starting in verse 10, And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant which I had made with all the people. And it was broken in that day, so that the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. So I'll get you to turn to Matthew 26. But this is a prophecy of the betrayal by Judas of Jesus Christ, you know, even down to the price on his head. So in Matthew 26, verse 14, it says, Then said one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot, sorry, then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priests, and said unto them, What will you give me? And I'll deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. So turn over to Matthew 27, verse 5. It says, And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple, and departed, and went and hanged himself. This is Judas. It says, And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them to the treasury, because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and brought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. 
Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. You know, so this way it's not difficult for, for the apostles and disciples. You know, in hindsight, they understood a lot of what was going on, the fulfillment of all these prophecies. You know, they knew the scriptures, and they were able to see the certain things that they'd read. You know, they knew he was the son of God because the scriptures from all the prophets prophesied of him. You know, so those, they were already waiting for the Messiah and they'd believed on the Lord. You know, so they were saved under the old covenant. They believed on the Lord. You know, so they knew who he was when he showed up and they believed on him. You know, and as the Lord's departing, after he's been glorified and he appears to them, this is what he says in Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So Christ here again is acknowledging that everything's about me. The entire Old Testament, the entire New Testament, it's all about Jesus Christ. You know, so they understood that all the pro prophets prophesied of him. You know, even if some of that knowledge came after the fact, they still understood that. You know, and we have the story of Philip expounding the scriptures of Isaiah 53 to the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, we also have Christ returning and expounding to the two men on the road to Emmaus. You know, when he spoke to them, and it says in Luke 24, 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So again, there's no doubt here, the entire scripture is all about Christ. Everything points to him. So uh, in Je Zechariah chapter 12, we'll get you to turn back there. So in Zechariah 12, starting verse 1, it says, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. So there's nothing that was made that was not made by him. And of course, I'm talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In Hebrews 1.10, it says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hands. And it even says um, earlier, I can't remember which, which reference it was, but we are also the works of his hands, you know, as men, he created us. We're the works of his hands. And, you know, that'll, that'll be important later. Um, but we'll keep reading Zechariah 12, verse 2. Behold, I'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All the burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, through all the people in the earth be gathered together against it. In that day, saith the Lord, I'll smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. I'll open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength and the Lord of hosts their God. In that day will I make the governors of Judah like an hearth of fire among the, among the wood and like a torch of fire in a sheaf. And they shall devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. And the Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and that he is feeble among them, and that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadramon in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family apart the house of David apart, and then their wives apart, the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart, the family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart, all the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. So I think first here, when it speaks about 
um, the Lord shall save the tents of Judah first, that he came first for his own people. He came to the people of Judah, you know, first to save them. But of course he came for the whole world. He came to die for the sins of the whole world. But he first came for his own people. And then it speaks about here, they shall look on him who they pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And again, we know this is, uh, this is fulfilled because in John 19 it actually tells us that this is fulfilled at that time. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but we also see that the houses are torn apart, you know, because they've lost their Messiah. And as you said, the covenant's broken with those people. It's a new covenant, a better covenant that he's brought in. And that's the covenant that we're under today. It's the New Testament. So I'll get you to turn to 1 John, and we'll also be turning to John 19. So if you want to turn to both of those. So 1 John 5. Starting in verse 6. It says, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, that's a controversial passage, but of course we see the Trinity here, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then we see in verse 8, verse eight there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. So John was a witness to the three that bear witness in the earth, as well as, of course, he was witness to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost during various times through the ministry as he's following Christ. But he also was witness to the three that bear witness in the earth. So, and we know it's a fulfillment of prophecy because it's laid out in the book of John, um, who also wrote the book of 1 John. So in John 19, 28, it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was a set of vessel of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. So this is where he dies. It says, the Jews therefore, because it was a preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, Thou shalt look on him who they pierced. But I also think that's important as well in 1 John chapter 5. Again, just remembering it's the same author. You know, he's speaking about his witness in 1 John chapter 5. Why is that written? That you may believe, uh, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God and have eternal life. That's why that witness was written. And it's why he also talks about those three things that testify the spirit, the water, and the blood. You know, so you've got the spirit, he gave up the ghost, the spirit's departed from the Lord, there's the spirit. You know, because they're all testifying of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That's what John's testifying of, that we might believe and be saved. You know, so he's saying that he's given up the ghost, he's, the spirit's departed from him, and you also see the water and the blood. And John's making a point here that, hey, I was witness to these things, I saw these things. And that's why I want you to believe. Because I saw Christ die on the cross. I saw him dead. You know, and then I saw him resurrected as well three days later. I want you to believe that. You know, this is what John's trying to get across. Because he wants to leave no doubt that Jesus Christ did die on that cross. That he did go to hell. Three days later he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. He wants us to believe that. So he was witness to all these things. And that's why he's making such a point of it here. In the book of John, in John 19 and in 1 John 5 that he was witness to these things. And so these are the three that bear record, you know, that he was the son of God because he did raise again from the dead and he was witnessed by John. Because I'm not sure all the disciples saw all those things, but John saw all those things. And he testified of the spirit, the water and the blood. He said, I saw them all. When he was on that cross, I saw it all. 
And uh, Hebrews 9.22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. And then, of course, Acts 10.43, To him give all the prophets witness, that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So we'll go back to Zechariah chapter 13 this time. We'll see another application, another prophecy here of Jesus Christ, starting in verse 1, Zechariah 13. In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered, and also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirits to pass out of the land. Now this is something we saw Christ do a lot of, causing these unclean spirits to depart. You know, he was casting out devils. You know, he was causing all these things to happen. And of course, the idols, once Christ came, you know, the idols, it seems like the idols seem to disappear, certainly for the Jews, you know. Um, but for us as well, we have the Lord to worship. We don't need idols made of silver and gold. You know, we have the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and I've already preached on Jesus Christ being the fountain of living waters. Um, so just to refresh, I'll just read this from Jeremiah chapter 17. It says, A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. So back in Zechariah 17. Sorry, Zechariah 14. Apparently I'm in Zechariah 13, sorry. Zechariah 13, verse 7. It says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and my sheep shall be scattered, and I'll turn mine hand upon the little ones, and it shall come to pass that in all the lands, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. I'll bring the third part through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and I'll try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people. And they shall say, The Lord is my God. So, you know, we see uh, 1 Peter 2 9, it speaks about that as well. That's why that's probably familiar to you. It says, But you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So, and again, we see that, um, you know, it says, uh, smite the sheep and the sheep shall be, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. Well, we see that as well in the New Testament. That's actually fulfilled. Jesus Christ quotes that. I thought I had it in my notes. I might have it later on, but uh, that is something that's quoted by Jesus Christ as, you know, he was the shepherd and I was talking about that after he was, to be crucified, that the rest of the disciples are all going to scatter. You know, so Peter's going to deny him and all of that. That's when that happened. So, as I mentioned before, you know, Christ is referred to as the root of, or branch of David. And we'll read from Malachi chapter 3, if you want to turn there. So, in Malachi chapter 3, in verse 1. It says, Behold, I'll send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, said the Lord of hosts. But who may abide in the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And we saw that again when it speaks about, you know, um, he'll refine them as silver and try them as gold. You know, that's what he does for us. He refines us, you know, because um, he is a refiner. You know, he, and it says, we'll continue on, he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. They may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And again, it's not about offering sacrifices. It's about, our, you know, our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. And, you know, our reasonable service is, you know, to keep the commandments and to live, live a godly life, you know, and this is what he expects from us. And this is how we can offer our sacrifice, is by sacrificing, you know, the things that we want in this world 
for him. It says, Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. And I'll come near to you to judgment. I'll be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, and against false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow, the fatherless, and the turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Now we see Christ, you know, doing all these things as well in the New Testament. Like you read through the Beatitudes in, in chapter 5, his Sermon on the Mount. You know, that's exactly what he's doing. He's a witness against the sorcerers and the adulterers. You know, he's trying to get people to just believe on him, you know, to have eternal life. You know, so just to, just to show us that, look, we're all sinners. We deserve to go to hell, you know, but if you want to be saved, just believe on the Lord. You know, and all the Old Testament prophesy of the Lord coming to save his people, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles also. You know, and it says the branch is to rebuild the temple. That's what I said in Zechariah. Um, so I'll get you to turn to Acts chapter 15. I'll just read to you from Amos chapter 9. So you turn to Acts 15. But in Amos 9 it reads, verse 11, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. I'll raise up his ruins and I'll build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Behold, the days come, said the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that sow a seed. And the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. Shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord our God. So Acts 15 is quoting from Amos chapter 9, a passage I just read. So we'll read it together, verses 13 to 18, and we'll get the meaning of what the rebuilding of the temple was in Zechariah and Amos. So starting in verse 13, Acts 15. After they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, after this will I will return, will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I'll build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. So I think one application you can make is when Jesus Christ says in John 2, you know, they answered, then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days will I raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. So I think that's one application there is Christ talking about how he's going to die and be resurrected. But in Acts 15 as well, James is explaining that rebuilding of the temple of the tabernacle of David was to bring salvation to the world, specifically Edom and the Gentiles and the heathen. And the branch being the Lord Jesus Christ, he came to save the Jew and the Gentile, in doing so rebuilding the temple, making no difference between us and them. You know, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. We are the people of God, the believing Jew and the Gentile alike. In Hebrews 3, it says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house, as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ is a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence of the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. In Acts 7, it says, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had at the point of speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possessions of the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob, 
but Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as said the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? You know, so he didn't come to build a tabernacle made with hands. The Lord will not inhabit such a place, as we see here in Acts and Hebrews. Um, but we even saw with the altars of the Old Testament, you know, they were to be made with, to not be made with hands, but to use God's creation of soil and stones that were not polluted with our hands or tools. So he says in, in Exodus 20 verse 22, And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make me gods of silver, neither shall you make unto you gods of gold. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen, in all places where I, re me, where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, for if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. You know, so just as Christ rebuilt his temple in three days, he received, you know, his glorified body. You know, we're also going to receive that new tabernacle at the resurrection. You know, if you read 1 Corinthians 15, you might understand a bit better about the concept of a new body, you know, after the, uh, after the rapture. At that point, you know, it says we're changed in the moment of a twinkling of an eye. But Christ is the first fruits. So he rebuilt his own tabernacle and he'll also rebuild ours. That's the promise we have that he'll do that at the end of time. And also we've got 1 Corinthians 6. Again, most of you should be familiar with this. It says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We will receive that new incorruptible temple at the resurrection, which is built by God and incorruptible. Uh, it's just like the new man that's in us is incorruptible. That new body is going to be corruptible, incorruptible. Sorry. In Isaiah 4, uh, you can turn there if you like. After that, we'll be in Isaiah chapter 11. So starting in verse 1 at Isaiah chapter 4. And it says, In that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread. And wear our own apparel, only let us be called by thy name, and take away our approach. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion, and, is, and he that remaineth in Jerusalem, shall be called holy, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall I purge the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For upon all the glory shall be a defense. And we see these themes everywhere, you know, through all the Old Testament prophets. You know, salvation of the world. You know, in that time they're looking for a future event. They're still waiting for the Messiah. But we can look back and see that significance. So in Isaiah chapter 11, in verse 1, it says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and fearfulness the girdle of his reins. In Jeremiah 23, it says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, said the Lord. Therefore thus said the Lord God of Israel, Against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whither I have driven them. will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. 
and I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and in his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. And Jeremiah, sorry, just continuing in verse 7, Therefore behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries whither I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. In Jeremiah 33, it also says this, It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised, under the house of Israel. This is the Messiah. He's promised them. He's saying, I'm going to perform this great thing that I've promised. He said, In these days at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith, he shall, wherewith she shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. For thus said the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man before me to offer burnt offerings and to kindle meat offerings and to do sacrifice continually. Because the sacrifice was taken away when Jesus Christ laid his own life on the, on the cross. So there's no more need for those sacrifices. That's why he's talking about there's no more need for the priests to seek someone to do sacrifices. There's also no need for a king because Jesus Christ is the king and the high priest. And in Ezekiel chapter 8, it says, And he brought me into the inner courts of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about fifty and twenty, five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east. And they worshipped the sun toward the east. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence, and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. So we see many times throughout the Old Testament, various prophets, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Zechariah, they refer to Jesus Christ as the branch. You know, not just the root and branch of Jesse, but his name is actually the branch. So in Zechariah 12, 8, it says, In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. The house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. It shall come to pass in that day. I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. They shall look to me whom they have pierced. They shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So this is the conclusion. Now, as we read first in Acts chapter 10, the gospel and the Lord's coming to die for our sins, it's found throughout all the Old Testament scriptures. You know, and this is just a few, a few verses in a few chapters in a few prophets. You know, there are plenty more as you go through. Even, you know, I noticed Pastor Stephen Anderson has gone through Genesis and Exodus. I mean, just the amount in there going through the Old Testament, that you see Jesus Christ is everywhere. In Romans 3, Romans 3.20, it says, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So again, the gospel was preached to them as well as unto us. In Hebrews 4, 2, it says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Hebrews 4, 6, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Colossians 1, 23, says, If you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. See in Galatians 3, 7. It says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, 
the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So the they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So it's an everlasting gospel. It's only ever been one way. You know, there's one door, one way, one salvation. You know, that's Jesus Christ by faith. You know, Abraham found that door by faith. Moses found that door by faith. Abel found that door by faith. You know, and Zechariah, he found that door by faith and he gave witness to it. You know, and it's not, if you want a balanced view of who the Lord is, you know, then I suggest don't ignore the Old Testament because there's just as much Jesus Christ in the Old Testament as in the New. You want to know who God is, you want to know who the Lord is, and especially know who the Son of God is, that's a great way to find out is to read through the Old Testament prophets. You know, everything testifies of Christ. You know, because Jesus Christ, he was the creator in Genesis. He was the redeemer in the Gospels. And he's the judge of all things in Revelation. You know, so just get to know him because he is the word of God. And I'll just end on Revelation 19 verse 10. It says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and one of thy brethren that of the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. So this book is a spirit of prophecy because every single word in here is the testimony of Jesus Christ. 